So I spent most of my time working on HIV. I'm a molecular biologist, a physician, but I spent most of my career dissecting this virus. And um, it was at the time when CERM came into being that we had just made the discovery about a host restriction factor, ApoVec through G, which I'll tell you about. Um, and the, the, the biology of HIV and the biology of stem cells came slamming together. And it was two days before the deadline. <laughs> and someone said, Warner, don't you think you ought to put in a grant to CERN about this? And so I wrote quickly, I wrote a grant, and it was funded. And it just turned out to be a fascinating line of investigation. But let me tell you a little bit about, okay. So each of us here in this room produce a factor uh, that can knock HIV right off its feet. That factor goes by a very weird name, ApoVec 3G. What is ApoVec 3G? Uh, it turns out it's, a, it's an enzyme that actually can inhibit HIV and many other retroviruses, but it's a DNA mutator that's able to take the oxycytidines and convert them into deoxyuridines. And this is an incredible uh, mutagen for the virus and ultimately can kill the virus. Um, and the way it works is that ApoVec gets incorporated, and this is a virus-producing cell, but viruses are budding out. And in certain circumstances, this host protein weasels its way into the virus, gets incorporated into the virus, and then in the next cell, this ApoVec springs into action to kill the virus. And it principally does that at this step during reverse transcription, where the RNA is converted into DNA, ApoVec springs into action, mutates these deoxycytidines, turns them into uridines, and ultimately this results in a severe hypermutation that kills, uh, that kills the virus. Um, so if ApoVec is so darn potent, why are 33 million people infected with HIV and why have 25 million people already died? Well, it turns out that HIV devotes one, uh, one, one of its gene, nine different genes, the BIF gene, to absolutely, its essentially sole purpose is to defeat ApoVec 3G. And the way it defeats it is it binds to it and targets it for a degradation in the proteasome. It also, it also blocks the synthesis of new ApoVec, and essentially so this virus producing cell is cleared of all the ApoVec. So there's no ApoVec to be incorporated into the virion, and the virion maintains full infectivity. So, uh, it also turns out that ApoVec can, can counter the virus in a resting CD4 T cell by blocking the virus from ever getting, getting going in the first place. And this, this effect is so early, and because there's no BIF in the virion, this effect is absolutely independent uh, of HIV, not independent of BIF. But now, uh, but, but HIV doesn't infect resting cells. HIV infects activated T cells. And so why is that? Because when the T cell is activated, that low molecular mass ApoVec disappears. It's swept into a very large RNA protein complex, which is really key for stem cells. This high molecular mass complex, now the, the formation of this complex opens the door to HIV infection. The low molecular mass block is gone. HIV exploits that window of opportunity to infect an activated T cell. So what the heck, why are we forming these high molecular mass ApoVec complexes? What's in this complex? Turns out over 100 proteins, but most importantly, the RNAs. It's an RNA protein complex, and the RNAs told us a great deal about what ApoVec, why ApoVec is moving into this complex. Turned out that the RNAs present, the, pro the most prominent RNAs, are two retro elements. These are jumping genes that live in our, in our chromosomes, and they can jump from one, uh, one place to another. Uh, and the cell has many, many defenses to specifically counter these jumping genes, because they can obviously wreak a lot of havoc. These jumping genes actually account for nearly 40% of our genetic material. Retrotransposons, retroelements that have been passaged through many, most have been silenced, but many are continued, even in humans, to be, to be active. Well, it turns out that, uh, so you can break these transposable mobile genetic elements into 
DNA transposons and retrotransposons. The retrotransposons are ones that look like viruses that have long terminal repeats. And then the ones that don't look like vi uh, viruses, retroviruses that have no LTRs. And these are divided into these long interspersed nucleotide elements called line elements. And then the short elements are called sign elements, principally alu and HY. Now these guys are so short, they don't encode any proteins. But they are able to steal the reverse transcriptase from the line elements in order to replicate. So in other words, the way these things replicate and jump is they make an RNA, but then the RNA is reverse transcribed back into DNA by the reverse transcriptase. ALU would steal it from line. And then that new, that new retro element then is inserted into a new place in the genome. Clearly, uh, well, so Apelbeck is actually responsible for defending against the internal threat posed by these endogenous retro elements in an activated T cell. So rather than posing the, the, the block to the exogenous retroviruses, Abelbeck turns its attention inward to try and protect the cell from these jumping genes which are activated during the process when T cells are stimulated. And sure enough, Abelbeck 3G is a very potent inhibitor <coughs> of the jumping ability of these ALU retro elements. It turns out that if you look at the Abelbeck family, <coughs> mice have only a single Abelbeck gene. But in the 100, roughly 100 million years of evolution, this single locus has been amplified to now include seven different genes. And indeed, if you look at the genetic sequences of these genes, these genes are amongst the most rapidly evolving, changing genes in the entire genome. Their rate of change is unbelievable. So they are under a severe genetic pressure that they are responding to. And this change certainly occurred well before the emergence of the primate lymphoviruses like HIV or the SIVs. And what's, what's believed to be clearly driving the expansion of this entire family is the, the need to control retro elements. So it turns out that retro element activity is at least a hundredfold higher in mouse than they are in mouse cells than they are in human cells. So indeed, the, the actual natural target of the Apelbex are these jumping genes within our own, within our chromosomes. But it turns out that so many features are shared between these jumping genes and exogenous retroviruses like HIV, that sometimes the Apelbex is able to oppose exogenous viruses as well as to contain endogenous uh, retro elements. Now, where are retro elements the most active? They're the most active in stem cells, and they're most active in germ cells. These are the principal places where high levels of retro element activity can be found in human cells. So now normally, in a somatic cell, like a lymphocyte, these retro elements are really, really controlled at a very fundamental level, at, right at the get-go. The DNA surrounding the retro element is methylated, and that turns off transcription, not able to make the RNA in the first place. But the situation in a stem cell is that during certain stages of development, the stem cells are actually, they lose this hypermethylation. In fact, their DNA is hypomethylated. And as such, now these retro elements can spring into action and begin to make the RNA. So our proposal was that in fact, in this particular situation, these retro elements turn on and they begin <coughs> to jump from place to place. So our proposal was that, in fact, Apelbex, which act at the downstream at this level of RNA to inhibit here, it's likely that the entire Apelbex family <coughs> may be playing a very fundamental role in terms of protecting the stability of the genome of the stem cell by impairing, uh, by, by forming the backup system. Since methylation is gone, DNA methylation is gone, the Apelbex system is now the principal, a principal protector of genomic stability within the stem cell. And so that is really what we've been exploring when, in, in the CERN grant. Obviously, uh, we don't want to be transplanting stem cells where there's all kinds of retro element retrotranspositions that have occurred. <coughs> We're testing this hypothesis. Indeed, the ret we've measured the levels of retro element retrotransposition. We've measured the different family members of Apelbex. It's very interesting. Not all the Apelbex are expressed in the stem cells. Uh, indeed, the ones that we thought would be the most active are not expressed at all. Um, and now we're using siRNAs to knock down these Apelbex in human stem cells. 
and then doing and then measuring the 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 effect upon that in terms of retrotransposition. But at any rate, what I've tried to show you is that this what started out as a as a study of HIV biology and this transition between low molecular mass and high molecular mass, the appreciation that these high molecular mass our complexes are forming to protect the cell against retrotransposition of various endogenous retro elements has, has, has really led to a new insight into how the cell defends and how it utilizes one particular enzyme to both defend from without and defend from within. And now the, the question is, in the case of HIV, can we actually come up with inhibitors that ultimately allow us to have our cake and eat it too? that allow us to preserve the low molecular mass, thus making the cell impermeable to HIV, uninfectable, but at the same time having enough high molecular mass that we can control the retro elements uh, that are, are trying to uh, jump uh, within, these, within these cells. And the grant was funded. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? Oh, I, I had one other thing. Uh, just last week, we published uh, talking, speaking to the issue of HIV vaccines. Apovax appear like they're going to play a key role in the production of neutralizing antibodies in the mouse system. If you knock out Apovax uh, and you, you try and infect mouse cells with this particular virus called Frenmos, it causes leukemia, not immunodeficiency. Certain mice, white mice, are incredibly susceptible to Fren virus, and the reason that they um, they, do, they die of friend virus infection is they're unable to make neutralizing antibodies. And the gene that encoded that ability to make neutralizing antibodies was progressively mapped and mapped and mapped and mapped into a, a region of chromosome 15 in the mice. We looked at that region and said, my God, Apovex right in the middle of that region. Sure enough, when we make the knockout Apovex animal, uh, Apovex 3, what we previously thought to be simply an antiretroviral factor involved in innate or uh, intrinsic immunity. It is an absolute key player for making neutralizing antibodies against, uh, against the friend virus. Now, will that translate to humans? Obviously, HIV-infected patients don't make good an neutralizing antibodies. HIV encodes VIF to destroy the ApoVec. Would a VIF antagonist allow now the production of effective neutralizing antibodies? Uh, very, you know, these are very early days, but the, the mouse studies that were just published last week really uh, are pushing us in a new direction toward, toward trying to solve the neutralizing antibody problem that plagues HIV biology. Where, because of stem cells over time, you grow in the lab, yeah. start to develop some mutations, you yeah. think about gearing up to growing large bats when Genentech gets involved, most of their large bats of them, maybe you should be trying to decrease mutations. Yeah. Do you think this able back will be kind of added because yeah, we, back, we certainly want to make sure that we culture the cells in ways that preserves the natural defenses against retro element retrotransposition. Because a lot of the mutations that are occurring are precisely that. Genes that are jumping and interrupting genes or causing massive deletions within chromosomes, etc. These retro elements can wreak havoc. So we have to make sure that in our artificial culture systems that we are not increasing that process and that to every extent possible that we're controlling it and making sure that we're preserving the stability of these genomes because ultimately these genomes are going to be responsible for for making uh, all the somatic cells that people are trying to uh, produce and we don't want huge mutations there. Speaking of which, I I think we better move on because we are yeah, really good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, well. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to leave it to Tom. I mean, is anyone, anyone looking at uh, analytic variants, uh, the black? Uh, yeah, so the black and the white. So yeah. one difference, why is one susceptible? And, and in the So in, in the mice, it turns out the susceptible mice splice out the second axon of Apovec and make a crippled protein. Turns out that there's a group of Italians who have been studied who are constantly exposed to HIV but are resistant. The gene has now been mapped into a region of chromosome 22, right where the able bit. And, and these Italians are making antibodies at the coastal surface. And it's mapping precisely to the able back locus. So stay tuned. I think this able back neutralizing antibody connection is going to really develop in an interesting way. Sorry. Excuse me. Is that where the studies were published? 
Uh, the mouse study was published in Science September 5th.